Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to our pre-recorded version of our Sunday worship service. We have a faithful congregation that follows this particular service. And so if you are a part of it, we're glad you're here. And if you're not part of it, we're glad you chose to join us for today. Sunday morning activities, of course, include the uh, church school classes, one of which is uh, Zoomed, and you can get more information about that in the church office. The Wednesday evening prayer service will continue what um, I did this last Wednesday was to use the epistle lesson which was not going to be used for the Sunday service to talk about and you know and maybe I'll do that through the month of January we'll see how that goes whatever scripture or is not used in the Sunday service that we'll use in the evening prayer service these are of course available by audio and uh, they may be accessed from the uh, church website from the home page. First notice is hereby given of the annual congregational meeting in a Presbyterian church. The congregation is guaranteed to meet once and uh, it may meet at other times, but in this case, this meeting kind of wraps up the year that is behind us and sets us to move into a one ahead and so that one will be held following the sunday morning worship service on january 31st and i think that is what i have to share with you if you'd like to follow along with what we're doing uh, here then we would invite you to the church website you where you may download a copy of the sunday bulletin let us worship God. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt God's name together. And as we exalt God's name, sometimes we look at ourselves, and when we look at ourselves, we acknowledge our need of God's grace. And the scripture tells us this, the proof of God's amazing love is this, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Because we have faith in him, we dare to approach God with confidence. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sins. Let us pray. Almighty God, you love us, but we have not loved you. You call, but we have not listened. We walk away from neighbors in need, wrapped up in our own concerns. We condone evil prejudice, warfare, and greed. God of grace, help us to admit our sin so that as you come to us in mercy, we may repent, turn to you, and receive forgiveness through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Having confessed our need the scripture also affirms to us, anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone. A new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. We rejoice in the knowledge that through Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. And the peace of Christ brings with it, or the forgiveness of Christ brings with it the peace of Christ. So the peace of Christ be with you. Peace seems like such a rare but incredibly value commodity these days. Let peace begin in you as the song says, but then share that with somebody or somebody's today through the week. We live at such a, a
polarized time with so much unrest. Peace has to start somewhere, so let it come from the grace of God that we have uh, experienced in our own lives, and then let it go out. Amen. We come to open the word of God together, and let us pray as we do so. Lord God, we open your word now. We pray that you open our minds, open our hearts, open our spirits, so that we may hear what you are saying to us, and that hearing we may hear what the Spirit is calling us to be and to do. And so as we read your word and listen for it as it is proclaimed, we ask that you convict us so that you can use us in your service. For we pray this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our scripture readings for today, and they are readings because we're using both the Old Testament reading and the New Testament reading to give us a complete thought as today we talk about conversations with God. So our first scripture reading is from 1 Samuel, the third chapter, verses 1 through now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begin, begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord God called, Samuel, Samuel. And he said, Here I am. And ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call. Lie down again. So he went and lay down. And the Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call my son. Lie down again. Now, Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again, a third time. And he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Thus ends the reading of the Old Testament. In the New Testament, we come to the Gospel of John, the first chapter, and we begin our reading at the 43rd verse. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? 
Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We have said before that the Bible makes some assumptions. The first assumption that the Bible makes is that God exists. It's never treated in Scripture. It's never proven in Scripture. It is simply assumed. In the beginning, God. Both of these readings, Old Testament and New Testament, uh, lead us to reiterate two other assumptions that are contained in Scripture. One of which is that God speaks. And the other is that human beings have the capacity to hear and understand. Now, these are shared by the major religions of the world. But these two assumptions uh, mean that we can have conversations with God. In other words, two-way communication. We can not only know about God, but we can know God. God calls us uh, to uh, particular ways of living. God calls us to particular tasks. Those who live within that framework of God's call and their response, these seem to have the most fulfilled lives. Now, the readings both tell of conversations with God and a sense of God's call. Uh, they each have their own dynamic, but both of these readings tell us something of conversations with God. And there are seven elements to these conversations that we can garner from these two narratives. Now, that's a seven-point sermon, and um, that seems pretty scary, but we won't belabor any point. But let's see what they are. Number one, it tells us that God is not sleeping. Uh, a deist believes in God, but a deist also believes that God, just like that lucky old son in the classic old song has nothing to do but roll around heaven all day. Now this story from 1 Samuel gives us an assurance and a warning. And it starts out by saying the word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. The house of Eli had lost uh, its spiritual power. And in the chapter preceding, the house of Eli had received a, the judgment from an unnamed prophet that there was about to be a changing of the guard at Shiloh. God would provide for effective leadership. You see, God is not satisfied with uh, past glories. 
either of people or of churches or of nations. When the zeal and the leadership of one goes flat, God will seek another leader. And God is always in process of calling those leaders. A young Samuel is called as a prophet. Or in the other reading, the twelve, uh, that the Son of God would call to carry on the ministry that he would start. So God is not sleeping. Number two, conversations are often aided by human assistance. Uh, Eli and his Household may have outlived its usefulness in leadership, but it was Eli who recognized a theophany. Now, that's a four-bit word that means God's manifestation in the human world. So Eli recognized this theophany in progress, and he helped a young Samuel into getting into conversation with God. In the other reading, Nathanael, who, well, he may be the disciple of Bartholomew in the other Gospels, but Nathanael may have been a worthy candidate as a disciple, but he needed someone, in this case Philip, to introduce him to Jesus. And such a person like Philip is often needed. Back when I was uh, at Texas Tech, there was a class that was taught by a professor who seemed uh, particularly intimidating and unapproachable. Uh, he had given an assignment that was to be a pretty major part of the grade, but few in the class seemed to have any idea how to go about it. Now, Billy Pelton was more forthright than the rest of us. He went to the professor's office to get some uh, definitive answers, uh, to find some help. Several of us were uh, sitting around commiserating over that abstract assignment one day when Billy told us of going to talk to the professor uh, in his office. He said, I, I told him that I was confused, and he was really pretty nice, and he helped me a lot. Well, based upon Billy's testimony, others of us went to talk privately to the professor, and our experiences were all similar, uh, and it set up a whole new dynamic for the rest of the semester. You see, what we, we just needed someone to get us into conversation. Well, isn't that much of what religion is about? Interactions based upon the experience of others? Our conversations uh, with God are aided by human experience and testimony. Oh, and, and by the way, that's one of the things that churches are about, combating this weakness of the myth of solitary religion. Number three, God knows who you are, and God knows all about you. Why did God pick Samuel? because God knew Samuel's potential. Uh, Nathanael uh, was impressed by the way Jesus greeted him. Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. He's quoting, of course, Psalm 32, verse 2 there. Jesus had seen him under the fig tree before Philip had gone to him. We don't know what Jesus saw, we don't know what uh, Jesus knew, but there was something about Nathanael, who was in the traditional place of peace, 
who was meditating and praying. And unlike the Pharisee of the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, Nathanael was making no spectacle of his religion. He was just struggling with it. Nathanael said to Jesus, in effect, well, here is a man who understands my dreams. And then Jesus uh, referred to another image, that, that image of Jacob and the ladder to heaven. That's uh, uh, back in Genesis chapter 28. He indicated in this relationship the conversation with heaven that is suggested there would be fulfilled. God calls people to particular tasks because God knows of the capacity to fulfill those tasks. When God comes to us, uh, it's often through human agents. Uh, today is uh, to be ordination and installation of uh, new officers, of elders and and. Uh, God has approached these folks through the church nominating committee. We alluded to this last week. Let's say it again. God calls us to no task that we do not have the abilities and the talents to accomplish. See, we uh, all too often assume that we can't do something. Well, others, somebody else is so much more qualified, but only to find that when we get into harness, we may be the best yet. Number four, experience is better than precept. One day, uh, St. Francis of Assisi invited a young monk to go with him on a trip to town he said to go preach oh the young monk was excited he, he was honored to have been asked and he quickly accepted so all day long they walk through the streets and the byways and the suburbs of the town they spoke and they interacted with the hundreds of people they met day came to an end and at the end of the day the two headed back home and not once had they ever addressed a crowd the disappointed young monk said i thought we were going to town to preach saint francis answered my son we have preached we were seen by many and our behavior was closely watched it is no use to walk anywhere to preach unless we preach everywhere as we walk. So we aren't told why Philip responded so quickly to the invitation of Jesus. I suspect there's a lot more to the story that could be told here. But he was convinced and enthusiastic enough to go to seek out his friend, Nathanael. When Nathanael made his own skeptical response, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip did not argue with him. Notice what he said. He just simply said, well, come and see. Few people have been argued into Christianity. Uh, preaching is bringing someone into confrontation with Christ. Again, there's more to the story. Something about Philip that allowed him to preach. Number five, the conversation may be found in unlikely places. Again, let's take a look at that uh, rather cynical response from Nathanael. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? 
You see, there was as much rivalry between the towns in Galilee as there is anywhere else. For Nathanael, Nazareth had to be near the bottom of the barrel. Whatever he expected of God's leader and wherever that leader came from, Nazareth wasn't likely. So we learn that we simply cannot limit interaction with God in expected places and in expected circumstances. I once gathered with a group of oncoming elders who were together for a time of orientation. And so to begin our conversation, we each shared experiences of uh, a significance awareness uh, or interaction with God. Now, of course, the details of those experiences must be left to the place in which, where they were shared. But there was a notable variety of settings and occasions and the rather ordinary experience that each one represented. To quote Elizabeth Barrett Browning, who is using the image of Moses' experience on the mountain, she wrote, Earth is crammed with heaven, and every bush is aflame with God. But only the one who sees takes off his shoes. The rest sit round and pluck blackberries. In some of the most ordinary or the most exhilarating uh, or the most unwelcome experiences that life gives us, there may be a unique opportunity for an encounter with God. Which brings us to number six, the need to listen. Eli gave Samuel some necessary advice. Remember, after by the time Eli figured out what was going on, he said to Samuel, now if he calls you, you shall say, speak, for your servant is listening. A conversation, especially a conversation with God, is really a two-way matter. It involves speaking and listening. Too often that we view prayer as something like what one does on Santa Claus's knee. At the motel where I worked for seminary employment, I had a co-worker whose name was Margie. She was uh, a gregarious and a fun person to be around. But Margie had one problem. Uh, her defective self-image manifested itself in that Margie was continually bragging on herself. One day, one of our regular business guest who stayed with us often happened to be passing by the front desk and he said to me a while ago I wanted to tell Margie what a good job I thought she was doing but she was so busy telling me what a good job she was doing that I couldn't get a word in. I wonder if many of us don't have a little Margie in us. Oh, we would, we would like to get some positive strokes from life. But sometimes we miss them because of the unlikely and the common places from which they may come. Or we may be so busy denying them that we have never listened for the times and experiences in which they do come. I think it was just a few weeks ago that I mentioned uh, 
of a stab that I once heard an evangelist make at a church denomination who has a slogan. They're fond of saying, where the Bible speaks, we speak, and where the Bible is silent, we are silent. And he went on to add, if they could just be silent when the Bible is speaking, they might get somewhere. Too many times, our concept of the uh, validity of faith rests in what we do. And let me affirm that what we do is important. But I wonder if the thing that impressed Jesus about Nathanael was his taking time to listen. Which brings us mercifully to the last number seven. Conversations with God will lead us to a sense of call. There may, that may be the problem with listening to God. We may hear something that we don't want to. Interaction with God may result in our being called to something besides what we're doing or living in a way besides the way that we're living. The late Dr. Paul Quillian was pastor of the First Methodist Church of Houston for some 15 years. And during his time there, the church grew from about 2,500 members to about 6,000 members. But when Dr. Quillian was a young man, he had little thought of ministry. He was uh, working in a bottling plant in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, when his minister paid him a call one day. His pastor asked him, how old are you? And Paul replied, I'm 30. Then the minister asked, When you finally stand before the Lord God, what will you tell him that you did on earth? Made red soda water? And the young man snapped back, Well, what's wrong with red soda water? The, minister, the pastor said, Nothing except that you are endowed with talents and abilities which I cherish for God and the Christian ministry. Well, as a consequence of that conversation, Paul Quillian went back to school and prepared for a life in the ministry. He itinerated for a while in Arkansas, and then he was finally called as the pastor of the First Methodist Church of Houston. He became a great leader because someone told him of God's call. And that's the way a conversation with God winds up. It never leaves us the as we are. There are some people in life who make red soda water, and we need those people, or at least those who make Diet Coke. But if we listen, some are called to uh, other pursuits, some to full-time Christian service. Others are called into uh, professional tasks and services outside the church, yet also have a ministry of employing their gifts within it. We talked about that last week too, didn't we? The whole thing rests upon our conversations with God. So we began this effort by saying those who live their lives within that framework of being in conversation with God, they seem to have the most fulfilled lives. 
And so today I invite you to open or to continue that conversation on this day that in our on-site service that we will be installing leadership. What difference will it make? Well, come and see. Will you pray with me? Almighty, eternal and loving God, you are the source of all life and being. Our lives themselves are a gift. This day is a gift. We pray that we use your gifts in ways that are pleasing in your sight. We pray for the world you have created that you sustain by your love, that nations may dwell together in harmony and the leaders of the nations may exercise their authority in honorable and just ways. Especially would we add today, this week, at this time, our own nation, that people may live without fear and hardship and pain, that we human beings may be good stewards of the earth's resources. We pray that churches of all persuasions may seek after and be led by your spirit. Empower its ministers and leaders and lead all its members to proclaim the good news of your love and live a life worthy of your love and care, acting as your voice and hands and feet in everything we think and say and do. Keep before us our mission and your priorities upon us as a congregation. As we celebrate your everlasting love and care throughout the ages, which we know in the life, teaching, death, and resurrection of Jesus the Christ, we commend to you all who have special need of that grace right now, that those who suffer in body or mind or spirit may feel your embrace, that those who mourn may take comfort from the knowledge of your presence, that those who are fearful may find the peace from the sense that you are near, that those who are confused or face hard decisions may follow your guidance, that those who are lost may find your salvation through your blessed Son. Guide us in this time of worship. Speak to us through your Spirit. Inspire us to become the people you created us to be and do what you call us to do. And so today, as we remember the victims of a raging virus or of winter storms, are those who died in the insurrection in our nation's capital. We pray that you hear now in our silence those concerns that lie deep within our hearts, those concerns known only to you. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time and with one accord to pour out our hearts to you. And you have promised through your Son that where two or more are gathered in your name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the world to come life eternal. For we pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So we come to the end of the service. There's so many things that uh, we can do. We can help enable the church by our offering. But as you leave this place, think of your relationship with God in terms of a conversation. God speaking of your hearing, of your response to that conversation. Be a part of this group that God is calling people to do so that Jesus Christ's presence born in a manger, manifested his baptism, and now as a part of his calling of disciples, one of those is you, by the way, that you may be his continuing presence in the world. And so may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace through Jesus Christ our Lord.